Hey there gang, time for another comic book unboxing video. I have here a nice little box of wholesome four color goodness, which I will be grading so that they can be sold on eBay. But here's the thing, I'm not the one who put these books in this box. I have no idea what I'm about to see. It will be as much a surprise to me as it is to you. So if you like comic books, stick around. We're gonna have some fun. Hey there, Bubby. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is an unboxing video. So please do like, share, subscribe, comment away, do all the groovy things. And this box, like the last few that we have seen, is an inventory box. These are books not that have been parsed out of a collection that has recently come in. We buy a collection through the website sellmycomicbooks.com. They come into our uh, warehouse in Freeport, Maine, and then we divide them into different sales streams. Rather, they are going to go to CGC and be sold on comiclink.com, or they're going to be sold on eBay, or they're going to be sold in our retail store, which is also in Freeport, Maine. It's uh, called .com Comics. Uh, or if you know they're gonna go into a dollar box or to a convention or something like that. These are books that were previously sorted to be sold in multi-book lots on eBay. They've been sitting in our warehouse sometimes, you know, a couple of years, two, three, four years even. And we recently went through some of those boxes and decided, hey, we think that could be sold on eBay at this point as a raw single. Raw single is a book that's not been slabbed. It's just a, your one single floppy comic book uh, that uh, we sell as a one book lot rather than a, a multi book lot. And I am the person who grades those books, so they've been given to me. So when we when we sell a lot on eBay, we try to get at least ten bucks for it. You know, rather it's going to be a single or a multi book lot, we want to get at least ten bucks. That's our target. We don't we don't hit it all the time, but that's that's the intention for each of these books. These books have been pulled out of inventory because we think that all by themselves they will sell for $10 at least. So keep that in mind as we go through this box. Rather you think we made a good pick or a bad pick. Uh, and again, you can always uh, keep up with the sales. Uh, go to eBay. The seller name is .com Comics. And rather you're interested in bidding or not yourself, you can track and see how these books do. So I've gabbed at you enough. That's enough of the uh, setup, certainly. Let us get on to the unboxing. That is what you are here for. And we'll see what we've got. And we're going to start out with some Star Wars books. Star Wars sells pretty well. Uh, the first few issues, anyway, are certainly worth doing as singles. Uh, and then, you know, later in the run, you know, it's kind of, you know, specific key issues. This is a nice book. Uh, we see this a lot, and that's... That's a dependable seller. That's a $20, $25 book all day long. This one probably, in this condition, should have been sorted as a single anyway. I'm surprised this one uh, was just sitting there in inventory. Red Sonia, that doesn't sell as well, but, you know, we'll try it. We'll see if it'll get to 10 bucks. Giant Size Hulk, that's nice. So we've got some, well, I was just about to say we've got some, uh, you know, nice Bronze Age books, but here's a Silver Age book with... Uh, <laughs> We've seen this book in past unboxings, and I've commented that this is probably a result of some kid, rather a letter writer or some kid in the neighborhood of uh, editor Mort Weisinger, who was like, you know, why does crypto have to be whatever kind of dog he was? I'm not sure I even know his breed. Why can't he be, you know, my dog, my, my breed of dog? So uh, <laughs> in this issue, for no particular good reason, crypto becomes a collie. Kind of a lassie. So that's neat. Another early Star Wars, there's number two, and World's Finest Comics. World's Finest Comics doesn't sell as well as any of the uh, uh, concurrent DC books, but still good. Tales of Suspense, and this one's fairly low grade, and we used to believe that, you know, it's under a four, you know, the kind of later run Tales of Suspense, Tales to Astonish, they should be in a multi-book lot. Didn't have to be a big multi-book lot, but to get to at least 10 bucks, you wanted two or three of those. But we're kind of thinking, you know, at this point, these, even though they look like they're probably, you know, threes and fours, probably leaning more towards the threes, uh, kind of thinking that these could be, could be $10 books. So I'm not calling out the issue numbers. You can see them as well as I can. There's a nice Superman story, and this is interesting. They always used to do this with these uh, quote-unquote imaginary stories where uh, 
your Superman was married and had kids, they would block out, even even looking at her from behind, they would kind of black out in shadow the uh, the wife. So you didn't know who Superman was going to marry. You know, it looks like that's probably Lois Lane, but it could be Lana Lang with her haircut. Could be somebody else. We can't see what's going on down down here. That could be Lori Lamaris for all we know. <laughs> Not Brad Eck. This doesn't do that well, uh, unfortunately. People just aren't into that Marvel satire, I guess, with the uh, the Forbish man. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that'll get to 10 bucks or not. It's in decent condition. I mean, it's browning up, but there's not a, you know, a lot going on there for spine ticks. Here's Not Brand Eck number two with uh, Iron Man, <laughs> Magnut, and who's this? Bat Beetle? I don't know who he's supposed to be. Super Brat. That's different. That's something you don't see every day. This is a um, Israel, I think his name was Waldenberg. So this is actually a reprint of earlier material, a story I've told before as well. But if this is your first video here, you uh, you might not know this. But um, this Israel Waldenberg fella bought a printing press. And along with the printing press, he got a bunch of plates from things that had been previously printed on that press, uh, which included a lot of comic books. So possession being nine-tenths, old Israel decided, well, you know, hey, I've got the right to just go ahead Reprint those books and put them out in the marketplace. <laughs> and he, he pretty quickly got some cease and desist letters. Uh, you know, some of the companies uh, had already gone out of business and were none the wiser, of course. Uh, but where where there were uh, your successors and where there were companies that were still in business, they kind of demanded he he stop. Um, and he really didn't. <laughs> He kind of just, yeah, I think he paused for a bit, but then kept on going. So you will also see these uh, IW books uh, as uh, super comics. You will see uh, that label on these books as well. So this super brat, I think this is Pat the Brat. He would sometimes do new covers, you know, in you know different titles. But the uh, the interior would be all reprinted. And again, I think this is Pat the Brat, which was a Dennis the Menace ripoff. I forget who the uh, who the original publisher was of of Pat the Brat. I want to say Archie, but I, I don't think that's right. Might have been Marvel, which was then known as Timely or maybe Atlas at the time. I think I think this is actually predates Atlas, or or you know the stories in here predate Atlas. All right, well let's let's keep on trucking. Here is, uh, this is pretty neat, Phil Silver starring as Sergeant Bilko. That's pretty cool. I would want that in my collection. Yes, I would. Little Lulu, uh, Little Lulu has, uh, or had, some very ardent followers, but like a lot of things, like the Fawcett Captain Marvel books, like the Westerns, like the, um, uh, what else, uh, Duck books, uh, it, it seems like the original fans of those books have died off, <laughs> frankly, uh, in number sufficient enough that nobody really wants these books anymore because most people don't, you know, most younger collectors, you know, age 40 and below, have no idea what this even is. <laughs> so, but there was once, there was once a time when Little Lulu was big, big, big business, not just as a new comic book, but uh, in back issue sales as well, but that will uh, that will languish, and I I have serious concerns that that will get to ten bucks, even though it's in pretty decent shape. I would snap that up in a second. Classics Illustrated. Uh, this is uh, this is a tough thing. Um, our Classics Illustrated generally don't sell that well unless they're low HRNs. And uh, well, here's a chance to do a, a quick little lesson if you're not familiar. So Classics Illustrated. Uh, those issues were printed and reprinted and reprinted multiple, multiple, multiple times. There would be like, you know, Frankenstein might have had as many as 20 different editions with with some actual, you know, separate editions in addition to just the reprintings. And the only way you can really tell what you have, because it will have the original copyright date in the indicia, and the indicia is that publishing information usually at the bottom of the first page or the inside front cover. So this says September 1945. This book was not published in 1945. This is a much later book. Uh, we can tell by the price. 
but also the HRN. And what we call the HRN, that's the highest reprint number. And basically, you look at the ad, it's usually on the back cover, where you could right away and get back issues of Classics Illustrated. Uh, usually in the back uh, cover, sometimes the inside back cover, sometimes on the inside front cover. And you can see that, you know, you know this isn't a new book because this is number 26, but you could right away and get as high up as issue number 146. So that's, that ad is what gives you an idea of, you know, which edition you have, how old it is, uh, based on the fact that, you know, another ad you might be able to order up to issue 200 or something, or you, you know, the ad might have said you could only get up to issue 60 or something. So that's, that's how you tell. And you can look at an Overstreet uh, price guide like, I, I happen to have one. I just so happen to have one sitting here next to me. This is not a recent one. This is, uh, and it's a little dusty. <laughs> Uh, this is the 39th edition. So this is this is an older one. I think we're past 50 now. But this is the one that happened to be sitting next to me. And if you look at... Well, give me a second. I'll look it up. I will look it up for you. So here's Classics Illustrated. And we're going to look for number 26. Boom, 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 boom. And most of this information is online as well. If you don't happen to have or don't want to pay the cash for an Overstreet. And so if we look here at Frankenstein and the one that has the highest reprint number of 146 is actually the 8th edition. Mike, well, uh, i got to kind of move the joker so I can get on screen enough for you to see. <laughs> there it is. There's the listing. You can see that the, that, that had eight, 19 different editions uh, and you can see here, you know, it only gives a date for some of them, but the one that had the highest reprint number of 146 was the 8th edition. And it's uh, it's the one, this is, this is the first time this particular cover appears. It says, you know, new painted cover. So that one might be a little more desirable to people who actually collect Classics Illustrated, and there aren't many of those anymore either. But, you know, the first edition with that cover it might be a little, you know, more of a bigger deal than even some of the earlier editions to those folks. So anyway, that was a quick down and dirty on Classics Illustrated. Always be sure to look for that HRN, that highest reprint number, usually found on the back cover. And that'll give you an idea of what you're dealing with. All right, moving on. Wonder Woman, number 204. That is uh, not too long after she got her costume back. She had, oh, and look, introducing Nubia. So that's a big deal. Nubia is, uh, they're trying to push Nubia on us in the new books right now. Um, <laughs> I say push, and I don't mean anything racial by that. Just that, you know, periodically is a way to goose sales. Uh, you know, they will try, and this isn't a new thing. People act like this is like brand new social justice stuff. You know, the companies have been doing this for decades. You know, they replace the original character for some period of time with uh, a newer character. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, you know, more recently it's a gender bent or a, a you know, racially different character. Uh, but this is, Nubia is, I'll say, big in the books now, currently. And here's her actual first appearance. And you'll notice that this is at a time when they don't actually show she's black <laughs> on the cover. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not saying racism wasn't a thing. Just <laughs> uh, okay. So Beware the Creeper, number three. That's a great series. Only lasted like seven issues, but uh, that is some fine, fine Steve Ditko work right there. That's number two. And here's number one. Bit of a spine roll and some rust on the staple, it looks like, but that's the first issue. And that would be his second appearance overall. Before this, he had appeared in one issue of Showcase, and this issue belonged to Bert. Looks like Bert wrote his name right there at the top. Good for you, Bert. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a Gil Kane cover. The last couple of issues were not done by Ditko. Ditko had a, a way at this period of... Um, launching a cool new interesting character and then kind of immediately deciding that because of what DC not really Marvel at this point but DC was doing with the character uh, he would kind of quit the book he would uh, he'd go John Galt and go on strike 
Uh, it was really only Charlton that would leave him alone and let him do as he wanted. So, and I think these uh, these were actually written. The first few issues, anyway, were plotted by Ditko, and actually uh, were written by Denny O'Neill. So philosophically, Denny O'Neill was kind of the uh, polar opposite of Steve Ditko, so it's not surprising there would be some conflict there. Werewolf by Night, a recent box, we saw a whole whole bunch of Werewolf by Night books, so here's some more for you. Here are some more for you. Don't know if we'll see any Moon Knights, I doubt it. Oh, this one's upside down, what is it? Fantastic Four, 364. I don't think it's Oculus is the reason this is in here. What is this a key for? I'll look it up and pop it on the screen. I don't actually know, but that's clearly got to be some kind of a key issue. Here's Fantastic Four. God, can you even read what issue number this one is? Uh, oh, for a time it was down here in the yeah, 402. So I don't know why that one's a key either. But right around this time period, unless it's a key issue, a first appearance of somebody or something, usually somebody or something that's been employed recently in the MCU on uh, uh, television, well, I say television, you know, the streaming service, Disney+, Plus, uh, or in the movies, somebody who wasn't thought about for decades but has, you know, been used in some other media, and so now people are going back, and that dollar book is now a you know, twenty, thirty, forty dollar book. It's got to be something like that, because otherwise, books from around this period are are legitimately dollar book fodder. Here's Punisher War Journal number one. And that one usually doesn't do that well. It's like a five dollar book, but we'll see. We'll see if it goes for ten. This is the original mini series with the great, great Mike Zek art, and all five issues of this do pretty well. Go over ten dollars fairly easily if it's in any kind of condition at all. The first issue does super boffo business. This is a funny series because they kept messing up this line at the top here. You know, this one says number five in a five issue series, but I think number four said number four in a four issue series. Uh, it bounced back a couple of times between telling you it was a five and a four issue series. And at this time, all limited series, initially, the first few limited series that came out, the first, the first intentional limited series in comic books was World of Krypton in 1979, and that was inventory uh, that was supposed to be uh, three subsequent issues of Showcase, but DC had canceled Showcase as, uh, as a fallout byproduct of the infamous DC implosion. And if you don't know what the DC implosion is, you can look that up. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm only about a quarter of the way through this box, and I really don't have time for the story right now. <laughs> and I've probably told you in past videos. So you can even look it up in one of my own videos if you want. But uh, uh, as a result of the DC implosion, Showcase was canceled. But DC wanted to you know, use up that inventory. So once, uh, once the market had kind of improved a little bit, uh, which was about a year or so later in 1979, uh, they decided, well, let's let's, you know, do a finite series because you know initially the, you know the comic book market was ongoing periodicals they were you know regularly published magazines for the newsstands but once the direct sales market took hold which started right about that time right around 77 78 uh you know the the publishers were pretty quick to realize hey you know we're dealing with a different clientele here not the casual consumer we're dealing with actual ardent collectors. Um, we could probably get away with just publishing something that's only going to last three issues. So World of Krypton was the first uh, limited series, and the model was generally three-issue series for the first couple of years, and then the standard became four-issue series, and then here's what all this has led up to. <laughs> this was one of the first five issue series these days they're all like 12 issue series what we what we back in the in the day would have called not a, a mini series but a maxi series uh we uh, would have called it that and uh but that's because today comic book writers can't actually write comic books <laughs> so in your 12 issue series you will get about enough plot for three issues back in this time period but anyway, this was one of the first that uh, went to five issues, and then the, you know, the standard would become six, and now like 12. Anyway, that was probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> wanted or needed. Here's an issue of Spider-Man, Spectacular Spider-Man, which uh, this one will fool you, because in the price guides and in the indicia, 
The actual title is Spectacular Spider-Man. You're not going to find this looking for Peter Parker, although there was a later series, both Peter Parker, Spectac the Spectacular Spider-Man, and just Peter Parker. Spe excuse me. That's really hard to get out. <laughs> let, me, let me try again. <laughs> you won't find this under Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. The actual title is Spectacular Spider-Man. Although there were later series, and even this series itself actually for a time was in the Indicia officially, Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man. And there were other series titled both that uh, later and uh, also just Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Wow. <laughs> As I always say, come for the comic books, stay for the high quality content. All right, moving on. This, I believe, is the death of, what's his name? Tyrese? Tyrone? I think it's Tyrese. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I watched uh, any of the shows of The Walking Dead. I cut out of the TV series uh, that episode where they murdered all of the people uh, that were sleeping in that radio station. They snuck in and killed them in their sleep. And I'm like, okay, these are not the heroes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this show is not for me anymore. They've crossed the line. And I, I never uh, got into the, uh, the comic book. I, I missed the boat on that entirely. Here's some more werewolf. More werewolf. Yet more werewolf. Oh, and you know, I should mention, uh, somebody corrected me in a recent video. I had said that George Perez got his start on Werewolf by Night towards the end of the run. When, uh, you know, kind of nobody else wanted to do the title. They knew it was going to be canceled. So he was given it as a kind of a tryout. Well, Right Church, Wrong Pew, the actual series he got his start on was not Werewolf by Night, but Man Wolf, uh, who was appearing then in uh, the title Creatures on the Loose. So that's pretty neat with the craters on the moon forming a skull. Here you go. That's, uh, that is kind of out of proportion. Uh, he, he's either <laughs> smaller than you would think, a pygmy werewolf, or that is one giant ass baby. Either way, either way. And you've got a Bruce Almighty moon here, or sun, hard to say. And there is a werewolf by night, uh, some more of it, some lovely, lovely. There's a, there's a moon night. Oh my God, my voice cracked there. <laughs> so, so excited. I had a puberty moment. Uh, this is the third appearance, I believe, of Daredevil. What did he, he appeared, I think, in, I'll get this wrong, just because I'm trying to remember. I think it was 32 and 33 uh, were his first appearances, and he was just kind of a knockoff character. Uh, they brought him back here. This is his third appearance, and uh, Moon Knight proved pretty popular right from, right from the start. Kind of took him by surprise a little bit. Here's some Brother Voodoo action. Got to love Brother Voodoo. You know, between this and the last batch, we're going to have a, a pretty complete run of Werewolf by Night available up for auction pretty soon. Here's Iron Man. That's near the end of the run. It might even be the last issue for all I know. All right. Let's pull out some more. Some more comic books, that is. These bags are stuck together. This is cool. Charlton Comics. Strange suspense stories with a talking tree. <laughs> or somebody inside the tree talking, hard to say. Here's Superboy with these uh, thought monsters. Something with a television screen on its head. Neat! Neat! So I've told you before, when we've seen that uh, issue 144 of the Avengers with the first appearance of Patsy Walker as Hellcat, I told you Patsy had been around forever uh, in the uh, Marvel Universe. And here she is in 1963, Patsy and Hetty Annual. Hetty was her uh, brunette um, frenemy, best friend enemy, Hetty Wolf. So there you go, there's Patsy and Hetty. And here's not the annual, but a regular episode. Patsy and Hetty, and it's funny, this is, <laughs> she had regressed by this point a little bit. Initially, Patsy Walker was uh, what we called a, a working girl title, and uh, then working girl came to mean something else. 
So uh, that that uh, that genre became known as career girl, a young woman out in the the working place, which was uh, you know in post World War II era was kind of new and innovative. Like oh my God, women with jobs, that's crazy. <laughs> but um, then she kind of um, regressed a little bit as the uh, infantilization of the uh, comic book industry came to play following the. Um, uh, what they call the ten cent plague, the uh, big commie scare. No, not commie scare. Excuse me. The um, I say that because Kehoffer also uh, uh, the senator there also led the uh, some of those uh, some of those Senate hearings, but he also led the Senate hearing into the origins uh, and causes of juvenile delinquency, and because of a fellow named Dr. Frederick Wortham, comic books were front and center of that. So they kind of dumbed down the comic books, toned them down anyway, and. For a time there, Patsy Walker became less of a career girl uh, strip and more of like a teen humor. You know, kind of like a slightly more sophisticated Archie. So, here's Millie the model, who uh, remained a career girl, although that got uh, infantilized to, a, to an extent as well. My Greatest Adventure with the Doom Patrol. So, this is number 83. What was their first appearance? 80... One or two? This is a pretty early appearance of the Doom Patrol. Millie the Model was quite popular. You had not only Millie the Model as a title, but for a time you also had Modeling with Millie. Pretty heavy inks on that, uh, that hairdo there. Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. There you go. A little Bugs Bunny action for you. Kid Colt Outlaw with his uh, cowhide vest. Looks like it was taken right off the cow. Might even have been one of those scroll cows, for all we know. <laughs> that was 109. This is 112. And this is either Jack Kirby or Dick Ayers trying to be Jack Kirby. Marvel Comics Presents. This was kind of a you know, $2 book for a long time, but recently uh, this has taken off. This is now uh, this is a pretty easily a $10, $12, $15 book. That was a weekly series put out by Marvel. John Constantine Hellblazer, number two. Wish we had number one, but there's number two. There's number three. Amazing Spider-Man 289 with the Hobgoblin revealed. Amazing Spider-Man 302. Some Todd McFarlane artwork here. All of the Todd McFarlane issues of Amazing Spider-Man are easy sellers. You can see these are kind of bent a little at the bottom here. Uh, but it's it's more kind of a wave that could be pressed out pretty easy. We don't press the books that we sell on eBay. Um, so you've got a lot of room to buy a book from us and press it and maybe boost it a grade or two if, if your intention in bu of buying it is to turn around and resell it. But uh, this looks like pretty good. And it looks like it was kind of sitting in a box that wasn't completely full. So it kind of bent that portion. And like, luckily, it you know it bent on this side not on the spine side. That would be harder to to resolve. California scheming. Scheming is what that says there on the cover. Here's the uh, homage to Action Comics number one. Very nice. Fortunately, you don't have the guy over here running, you know, into the foreground screaming because the UPC box is in the way. You know, and it's, it's really funny to me. You know, like on the direct sales editions, if you had the ability to take out the UPC code and put in some little, you know, drawing, and the reason they didn't have a UPC code was partly to distinguish the newsstand books, which were returnable, from the direct sales books, which were not. And so sometimes you would have a retailer who would have an account with both, you know, the direct sales distributor, whoever it might be. There were, once upon a time, many, many choices. And they would also have an account with a regular newsstand distributor. So they would, the, the direct sales books would come in first. They'd order so many of those. They'd order, like, just enough to get them through the first week. And then the newsstand books would come in, and that would pick up any stragglers. And then whatever was left over, they could return for credit. And you know, have less of a chance of getting stuck with uh, any, uh, any unsold copies. Or at least a, you know, a, a greater number of unsold copies copies than they were comfortable with sticking in their back issue bins. Uh, and so, what was I talking about? Why, uh, oh! <laughs> um, <laughs> so, if they had the ability 
to take out the UPC code and put something different in the box to help mark this as a uh, as a direct sales book, why couldn't they have just taken the box out entirely, have no UPC code? Oh, and I said a couple of reasons. The other reason was back at this time, this is early 90s, the vast majority of comic book shops, there were five times as many then as there were now, best guesses, it's probably under 2,000 comic book stores nationwide. But uh, most of them, still now to some extent, but even then to a, a much greater degree, most <laughs> comic book stores were, let's say, not um, not super professional, super sophisticated. You know, you had a lot of uh, cigar box cashier systems. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they certainly generally did not have any scanning system. So there's no point in, you know, sending a UPC book to uh, the comic book stores anyway because they, they wouldn't have been able to scan it. Uh, they You know, most of them, the vast majority, wouldn't have had any ability to even deal with that technology. But like I said, why not just take the box out entirely? And then you could indeed have had that guy in the foreground running and screaming, holding his head uh, like a fool. All right, well, that's another that's another topic I beat up entirely. There's some more Todd McFarlane. And we'll go to the next stack, next little stack here. And actually, we will not. <laughs> because uh, this unboxing video initially took about an hour, and that's too long. Yeah, I know, I know that I have asked you folks before, and, and those of you who have been kind enough to comment have said in the comments that, hey, however long it takes. You know, we're having fun. We're here for the duration. And I believe you, I do. But, but the analytics tell a different story. And <laughs> most people who watch my videos only watch about half of them. And that's when they only run about a half hour. So I don't want to push it. I need to feed the algorithm, especially now as I am getting pretty close to a thousand subscribers and that sweet, sweet monetization. So uh, I am going to pop a chop right here. Please do come back tomorrow. We will finish off this video then. We will see what additional four color wonders this box has to behold, see what stories we have to tell. So. Again, come back tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, because speaking of the algorithm, I am trying to get on a, a more regular uh, rotation of uploads. Um, I'm trying to, trying to hit one a day around 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And then maybe we'll have a second video some days. But uh, yeah, come back tomorrow. I hope to see you then. And until then, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.